Welcome to the GSMC Car Podcast, the show that takes you on a journey to the automotive world. We talk about the latest news, from new makes and models, to new technology, to all of the must-have options available. Whether you're a fan of the old classics, love the latest models and technology, or have never met a vehicle you didn't want to work on, the GSMC Car Podcast has something for every car enthusiast. Welcome to the GSMC Car Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, David Lucy Mabel. Today, folks, we are going to start doing something very special and something that is a bit different. Commemorating our debut on Instagram and me really taking social media seriously concerning this podcast, not just having a Twitter account, but also an Instagram account in which we already have 21 followers as of today, and the account was started the day before yesterday, so within two days, we've gotten about 21 followers, about 10 followers each day. So I don't I I feel like that's just some initial people. It might slow down, but I'm remaining hopeful that we we can get some more followers to, you know, start listening to this podcast. I am going to start doing a podcast series on the most influential cars of each decade. I was inspired by Donut Media's recent video on the most powerful cars of each year, and I was like, you know what? I could do something um, similar as far as like a timeline goes, but instead of doing the most powerful cars sold each year as far as horsepower goes, I'm going to do the most influential cars of each decade. Now, for me to go over Every year since cars were created and do a podcast on one car from each year, it would be way too long, and it would be, oh goodness, it would be over 130 pod, I mean, it'd be, it'd, it'd be over 120 podcasts, because cars have been around, as you will soon find out, since the year 1886, um, in which Carl Benz invented the patent motor wagon. So let's get started. Um, as you all already know, um, I am doing this to commemorate the GSMC Car Podcast debut on Instagram. We will be doing in-depth series on the most influential cars from each decade, starting with the 1880s and onward. Uh, this is an effort to gain a following on social media and to look back on car history as a whole. Uh, the 1880s was a decade that saw the debut of the first modern automobile. So because the first modern automobile was produced in the 1880s, it only makes sense that the podcast would start with the 1880s as the main decade, and then it would go to the 1890s, the 1900s, 1910s, and so on. Um, and you will find that you get a much more in-depth look at car history when you see the cars made in the decade, and then you take the most influential cars of each decade. So we're going to get started. Uh, Carl Benz invented the car in 1886. This car was called the Benz Patent Motor Wagon, and it was also the first production car, as these cars were produced from 1886 to 1893. Only about 25 of them were produced. When you consider that Carl Benz was building these by hand, and they would probably take him several months to complete, I mean, you know, it's pretty impressive that in a span of less than 10 years, he produced all of these in seven years. He produced 25 Benz Patent Motor Wagons in seven years. That is 
a lot that is a lot of cars especially when you're talking about this is the first automobile automotive production lines were not yet a thing automotive factories were not yet a thing i mean these were you know these were the the pioneering times where if you wanted to get a car out to the market you had to design it yourself you had to build it yourself you had to build your own engine yourself you had to do everything pretty much yourself you might have hired apprentices apprentices to help you out in your workshop but everything was largely done yourself and everything was largely handmade and built to order essentially so the fact that he was able to build 25 of these cars in seven years is actually very very impressive so uh moving on um i will say that all modern cars owe their ancestry to this car the 1886 benz patent motor wagon now let's let's go back to the you know to those times um in those times as you all have seen from movies and really as you all have learned from history because in the grand scheme of things this wasn't that that long ago i mean think of it just oh probably four or five generations back if you look at any you know 20 something year old four or five generations back they had ancestors living in that time i mean my dad was born in 1967 my grand grandmother was born in 1940 my great grandmother was born in 1902 and my great great grandmother was born uh, somewhere around you know the 1860s maybe the 1870s so i mean you know we we have people alive today that knew people that were born in that time period so the fact that this was able to take off and the fact that this was able to be done really shows you that this is not a very this is not a very long time ago it's not a very long time ago at all so when you see the advancement of technology over the course of human history however long if humans have been around on the planet i'm not going to go into all of that because different people say different things different sources say different things different people believe different things but point is humans have been around for a long time and civilization has been around for several thousand years so you take a look at you know advancements in technology and then you get to around the 1850s 1860s to now over the past 150 160 years just about i mean technology has skyrocketed i mean we're we're talking about this pens bat and motor wagon which was built largely out of wood with some metal tubing holding it all together and now we have mercedes-benz debuting an ultra screen for their dashboards i mean in which the entire dashboard is a screen integrating the gauge cluster the climate control the radio controls the whole entire span of the dashboard is a screen mercedes-benz has just announced this that it's you know that they're it's not in cars yet but that they're working on it in development and whatnot this is the this is the advancement of technology i mean you think about the time in which there was which i mean you think about the times of the pyramids the pyramids to 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 the greek conquest of egypt to the roman empire to this to that all sorts of other things i mean in 150 years we have advanced more in technology than they did in the past 1500 years before all of that so now think of that in terms of the car benz patent motor wagon very simple very primitive by today's standards and yet it revolutionized an age revolutionized an age and had forever changed the world something that happened just 150 years ago you think of it back in those times when you lived in like ancient rome nothing that happened 150 years ago changed the entire world 150 years ago in the with let's say you're living in the roman empire like i don't know 40 bc or something or whatever the roman empire existed and let's say you take 150 years before that life was largely the same you of course you would have gone through different rulers different emperors or different caesars whatever they called them but as far as technology what people did on an everyday basis technology and you know developments remain the same things happened a lot slower so to them 150 years ago 
was not nearly as far removed from what they were currently doing as 150 years ago is for us today. 150 years ago, it might as well be the Middle Ages. I mean, nothing was the same. Nothing was the same. Living situations weren't the same. Schooling wasn't the same. In this car case, cars were definitely not the same. So this is why I wanted to do this. So really, so you can drive the point home that, oh my gosh, this is something revolutionary. This is something insane. And cars that we take for granted nowadays, just in the time of our great-great-grandparents, were a luxury commodity that most people could never hope to even own. That is until Henry Ford came around in like the, you know, the 1920s. But like still, this was this was insane. This was absolutely insane. So I, I just wanted to start a, pod, a podcast series on this, hoping that this would get off the ground and attract people on Instagram to listen, to like, to follow, to do any sorts of um, things related to that. So I'm very excited, very, very, very excited to do this. Um, and I, I'm hoping that you all enjoy. But, you know, the, the, the cars, the cars are something that are extremely that are extremely important to our everyday lives. I mean, you take everything from your lowly Mitsubishi Mirage to your Aston Martin Lagonda Taraf. I mean, you know, every single car has its importance. Every single car has its place. Every single car has has made an impact, whether it be a negative impact or a positive impact. Every single car ever made has some impact on the car world, the car scene, history in general. And I feel that it is very important for us to look at history, for us to look at history and for us to analyze how exactly these cars were influential. So in over this course, you'll hear obviously about cars like the Ford Model T and the, um, whatchamacallit, the uh, Volkswagen Beetle, but you'll even hear about some more obscure cars like the Cadillac V16 or the Bentley 8 liter. I mean, I will make mentions of all of those cars at some point because these are cars, not only were they, they, I guess, not only were they important, but they they are so important that history should not forget them. They were revolutionary. They were not just important. They were revolutionary. I mean, the Volkswagen Beetle was not just an important car. It was absolutely revolutionary. I mean, it completely changed the way, you know people were able to afford cars. It was like the Ford Model T of its day. It was the best selling car on earth. A record, you know, that has maybe just recently been beat, maybe by the Toyota Corolla, if I'm not mistaken. But as far as a single platform and a single generation, that was the longest running car ever known. And then you get, you know, some some cars like the Chrysler K cars, which are not a, a specific car, but which are a group of cars that saved one of the largest car companies in America. And then you get cars like the uh, the, the uh, Ford Mustang that created a new segment of the car. And then you have cars like the Ford Thunderbird that also created a new segment of cars. And then you get cars like, you know, some French cars. It was the French that, that invented the first front-wheel drive car. I mean, all of these are influential cars that deserve a mention in some way, shape, or form. So I hope you all enjoy this series. I hope you all get something out of it. I hope it does you well, and I hope you're very interested in uh, finding out. So in the next segments of the podcast, basically how these are going to be structured. Um... These are going to be a bit different structure than my previous podcast, because um, if you all have noticed how my podcasts go, typically there is one about a specific car, then there is one about either a class of vehicles or maybe practical advice on how to buy a vehicle, something generally car related, but not relating to a specific car. And it goes back and forth. I try to do that every other podcast, unless there's something new and exciting in the car world that I have to report on which that's what I did with Stellantis. Before that, you know, I did specific car and then I had done something about, oh, let me look back in my notes here. We had done, 
Come on. We had done, ah, yes, not uh, being afraid of doing it yourself, which are tips. And then I had done something about uh, Stellantis which wasn't a specific car, but it was news in the car world. And so now I'm doing something on the most influential cars of each decade. But yes, anyways, back to what I was saying before I got down that rabbit hole. Um, We're going to be doing these podcasts in such a way that I'm going to introduce the car. And then in segment two, I am going to give you the specifications of this car and basically giving you the inner workings, how these cars functioned. And from that, you will be able to gather why these cars were so influential and really for you to kind of look back and smile a little bit about how cars were made back then and how different they are from cars today. I mean, when you hear, you know, some cars had two cylinder engines, that's absolutely unheard of these days. But, you know, back in the early days of cars, I mean, a two stroke or uh, not a two stroke, a two cylinder engine was a huge deal. I mean, you know, a two-cylinder engine that could produce, like, 20 horsepower is like, whoa, like, that's crazy. I mean, but nowadays, 20 horsepower is absolutely nothing. I mean, your, your, your lawnmower probably produces 20 horsepower. I mean, let's be honest. And then in segment three, we're going to be discussing the other cars that existed during this time period. Because in order for you to fully understand the impact of a car, you have to understand what other cars existed at that time period as well. Because cars don't exist in a vacuum. Car manufacturers don't all get together and produce one car. They all compete against each other. So there were different cars, even competing against the very first car, the 1886 Benz Patton Motor Wagon back in the 1880s. It had competitors from the very beginning. Because that's how car um, culture, that's how car history has worked. This is what it is. I mean, it's basically, you know, a competition. And then you, you know, at the end of segment three, you'll have a little blurb about um, just some other things that were going on in the decade, recent, um, not recent, relevant history, um, facts of that sort. And of course, segment four is always going to be my thoughts because I have to share with you my thoughts too. And now that I have a social media platform that I can actually, you know, engage better with followers because Twitter, Twitter is a hit or miss, but with Instagram, I mean, you're able to really engage better with your followers. I can start posting questions on the Instagram page and say, what do you all think uh, was the most influential car from this, you know, time period? And even with the small number of followers now, I mean, hey, maybe I might be able to generate a couple of answers and give a shout out to anybody who might be listening in the in the dark void of podcast listeners out there. But anyway, please stay tuned for the next segment. We are going to be discussing the specs of the 1886 Benz Patent Motor Wagon. So please stay tuned. Are you a business owner? someone interested in the latest news that might affect your business? Then check out the GSMC Business News Podcast, a show dedicated to keeping you up to date on all things concerning business, technology, and the stock market. Get a head start on the day as we keep you updated on the latest goings on on Wall Street, money, jobs, and technology. The GSMC Business News Podcast has you covered. Alrighty, folks. So here we are. We're back, and we're going to be discussing the specifications of the Benz Patton Motor Wagon. In the first uh, segment, I introduced to you all uh, why I started doing this podcast, what I achieved to aim out of this, and I started telling you all a bit about car history of this time period and how really it's changed and it's advanced and it's caused you know the world to really shift on a you know to really shift on a dime to really change. I mean, especially in the grand scheme of human history. But yes. We're going to be talking about the specs, but before I get into the nitty gritty of the specifications, you all must know, Carl Benz did invent 
the car in 1886, but he invented the internal combustion engine in 1873, and that was 13 years earlier. Benz developed the first internal combustion engine, a two-stroke engine with pistons. He, he basically used the same principle of today's engines. Now, the one difference between two and four-stroke engines is, I believe... Oh dear, I believe two-stroke engines need to have gas and oil mixed together because they, 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 there's, the one, there's a way the valves work inside of the engine. There's, it's two cycles instead of four. So I can get into the nitty-gritty of that when I learn about it and I'm able to relay that information to you. Point is, the modern combustion engine far and wide is a four-stroke engine. And then back in those days, it was a two-stroke. But... Nonetheless, it used pistons. It, it was a piston-driven engine. It used the same basic philosophy as the engines we have nowadays. Of course, didn't have variable valve timing or overhead cams or, you know, four-wheel drive or any of that foolishness that we take for granted these days. But it had the same principles um, intact. And that really carried on that DNA into the engines we have today. Of course, not all internal combustion engines are piston driven. Some are rotary engines, but the most popular ones, the most successful ones, the most reliable ones, and the most viable ones are piston driven engines. Because, you know, you know, rotary engines, goodness, I mean, after 100,000 miles, apex fields start going bad. It's basically not, it's basically not useful anymore. It's basically useless at that point. So, he sought out to make a motorized vehicle um, using those same principles, using an engine similar to that. His first motor, uh, uh, motorized vehicle that came out in 1886, the Benz Patton Motor Wagon, actually was a four-stroke engine, so even more similar to um, cars nowadays as far as their uh, powertrain goes. So the 1886 Benz Patton Motor Wagon specifications. Now, these... These made me smile a little bit, but at the same time, it's not a condescending smile, it's an endearing smile, because you see how far, you know, the cars have come, how far mankind has come as far as developing car technology. So you get the Benz Patton Motor Wagon that had three wheels with a rear-mounted engine. Granted, the three-wheel setup that he used was the same three-wheel setup that the the Reliant Robin used with uh, the small, the single wheel in the front and then the two wheels in the back. It proved on the Reliant Robin to be extremely unstable. This one seemed, however, to be less top-heavy because really it was just an open platform with a seat and engine and, you know, some controls. It wasn't like a closed-bodied car that was trying to act like a regular car but only had three wheels. No, this this one didn't flip over. I mean, this one was safe. I mean, Bertha ben ask, ask Bertha Benz when you get to heaven someday, you know, whether it was safe or not. I mean, she took the first road trip in it. But but, um, you know, the thing is, it had three wheels with a rear-mounted engine. Uh, the body was constructed from steel tubing and wooden panels. I think the only car company that still uses wood as a structural component of their cars is the Morgan... M Morgan... Um, Morgan Motor Company, I think that's what they're called. There's some boutique manufacturer out of England that has been known um, for probably the past, oh, probably 90-something years making sports cars like Roadsters and whatnot. And even in their most modern vehicles, they still use ash wood. Ash wood is very, very, very durable and very, very, very strong. So obviously it can handle the rigors of, you know, automotive use, especially as a um, structural component. But... Um, yeah, nowadays, besides Morgan Motor Company, I don't think anybody uses wood as a structural component of their cars. I mean, that's, that's kind of yikes, honestly. I don't think that would pass safety inspection. But, of course, in those days, wood was extremely common. I mean, when you think of it, carriages were made of wood. Uh, a lot of train cars were made of wood. So, it only made sense 
that the first car would have a lot of wooden components. So um, moving on, um, they had steel spoke wheels with solid rubber tires. Um, the 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 um, pneumatic tire didn't come until oh probably. 30 years after the invention of the car. Most early cars had, all had solid, you know, tires. I mean, it probably didn't come until 20, 30 years after the invention of the car that pneumatic tires became the norm. Um, pneumatic tires, cars, you know, cars with tires that fill with air. I mean, nothing else. I mean, solid rubber versus air tires. I mean, air tires are a lot better. They're a lot better for, you know, smoothness. Of ride, there are a lot safer. There's there's a lot of benefits to having you know air in your tires instead of solid rubber tires, and not to mention they're a lot lighter. I mean, you don't want solid rubber tires on a modern car, going to weigh it down like you know lead weights or something like nobody's business. But this would also have a engine that had a single cylinder, and get this, had a horsepower rating of two-thirds of a horsepower at 250 RPM. That's cute. My car makes 240 horsepower at like 4,600 RPM, and even that Hailed in comparison to some cars that are standard, you know, cars that people drive every day. I mean, like you could get a Toyota Camry with like 280 something, 300 horse, but something ridiculous, something ludicrous. I mean, like you don't need 300 horsepower in your, you know, in your family sedan. Granted, it would be nice to have 300 horsepower, but you don't need it. I mean, my supercharged Buick, granted, the supercharger is kind of lazy, but with 240 horsepower, goodness, I get up to speed just fine, goodness, and I'm still able to beat, you know, you know, small BMWs off the line if I really wanted to, um, you know, powering the front wheels. But yeah, this had two-thirds of a horsepower at 250 RPM. Um, the later iterations would have 1.5 horsepower and two horsepower respectively. He made a second and a third iteration of the Benz Patton motor wagon that had more horsepower. And I think the top speed of the Benz Patton motor wagon was something like 10 miles per hour or something, you know, sad like that. But <laughs> nonetheless, this was the very first car ever made. So we can't expect it to be running laps at the Nürburgring. I doubt Nürburgring even existed in those days. So I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not, you know, racing against anybody. Right now, at this point in car uh, uh, history, you know, if you make a car that stays together, that's that's probably what you're going for. You just don't want it to fall apart. Later on, did people start getting concerned with top performance and speed and other sorts of that foolishness? I mean, in the early days, you made a car, and if it stayed together and didn't break apart when you ran over, like, you know, a pebble or something, that was considered a success. So I would say Ben Spat and Motor Wagon, definitely successful. Um, later models received a fuel tank. <laughs> yes. The first one did not have a fuel tank. Get this. It had fuel-soaked fibers that would supply engine to the cylinder by, like, evaporation. So, like, gas fumes drove the engine. I have no earthly clue. How did Carl Benz manage to make a car without a fuel tank? But he did, and it ran. So, yes, the engine, the, uh, the the later models, I should say, got engine upgrades, and they had a fuel tank, and they had leather brake shoes. Imagine trying to stop, like, a Rolls-Royce Phantom with leather brake shoes. These things have, like, two calipers on each disc brake because they're just that big, and they need to stop. Or imagine stopping a Maybach 57 with leather brake shoes that's absolutely hilarious i think i think that's i think that's just super cute and super comical and so yeah honestly i just had to mention that to you all and then he actually went to wooden spoke wheels instead of the steel spoke wheels so he started out with steel but they ended up going to wooden spoke wheels which actually i'm not going to poo poo wooden wheels because wooden wheels are very durable granted that they don't rot um there the wooden wheels were very very common on automobiles for oh the first 20 30 years or so um by the way in case if you all didn't, you know, notice this when I said it in the first podcast, Bertha Benz became the very first uh, became the very first person 
to take a long distance road trip in the third model of the Benz Patton motor wagon. She even performed basic mechanic work on it. The story goes she was going to visit family or she was going to visit her hometown, which was 66 miles away um, from where she lived um, with Carl, her husband. So Bertha packs their two sons um, in this Benz Patton motor wagon, which I didn't even think this thing had three seats, man. But apparently it did. Um, she takes her, 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 her sons, who were both uh, around 15 years old. One was 14. The other one was 15. And then she takes them on this 130 two mile round trip or something like that um i don't know i can't do math right now 60 times 2 is 120 one uh, six times 2 is 12 120 plus 12 is 130 yeah 132 mile round trip 66 miles in one direction 66 miles back and she did it to not only for practical purposes but to prove the viability of the car because in those days people were so skeptical i mean you you gone from thousands of years to using horses that have been proved to be very reliable modes of transportation. Granted, they're a living being, so they need to stop for water, for food. They need to use the restroom, things of that sort. I mean, but like you gone from horses pulling buggies and pulling wagons to all of a sudden you got this newfangled contraption that moves itself. Hence the name automobile. It was self from the Latin for self, auto, and then mobile, well, to move, it's mobile, so automobile, self-mobile, automobile, self-moving, I mean, like, what? It's a self-moving machine. These things shouldn't exist. I mean, when locomotives came out, people thought that going 50 miles per hour would be dangerous for the human body. Like, this is how, you know, resistant that people were to advances in technology in those days. So Bertha Benz did this to prove a point that her husband's invention not only was safe, it was viable, and that it could be used on a regular basis for regular everyday commuting, or at least not commuting because people didn't commute in those days, but getting around. And it was amazing. I mean, at some point, the leather brake shoes had worn out, so she stopped and then tacked on new leather to the brake shoes. Um, I mean, she she became the first female motorist. And to this day, the the the, the journey that she took in 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 in, in Germany is marked off as the burn uh, the 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 Bertha Benz um memorial uh, route or memorial road trip or something. So one day I'm going to drive that, but I haven't I haven't had the chance to do that yet. But like, it's just amazing. It's just amazing. I mean, the the specifications, you know, imagine driving 66 miles, you know, in a car which top speed was 10 miles per hour. And that was probably 10 miles per hour with one person. Imagine having three people on this car. Like, that's just, that's crazy. The fact that you could fit three people on what was essentially a rolling wooden platform, a rolling wooden platform with some steel binding it all together. I mean, you're able to fit three people on this. You're exposed to the elements. You've never done this before. Nobody's ever done this before. And you're going on a 66 mile trip and you have no earthly clue what's gonna happen. I mean, this woman was a pioneer through and through. So I respect Bertha Benz very, very much. But please stay tuned for the next segment of the podcast in which we are going to be discussing some other cars that discuss, uh, that uh, uh, um, existed in the 1880s. And not only that, but what are some world events going on during this decade and how might that affect or at least not how it might affect it might not affect it at all but basically to give you a perspective on how long ago this was but also how not so long ago it was it's kind of a weird thing but you're going to want to check it out so please stay tuned for the next segment of our podcast Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. 
Network. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Right, welcome back, folks. In the first segment, we discussed uh, we discussed the introduction to this series of podcasts on the most influential cars from each decade. I told you all why I wanted to do it um, and other sorts of uh, reasons of that sort. And then in the last segment, we discussed the specifications of the specific car that we were discussing, which is the 1886 Benz Patton Motor Wagon, the car that started it all. So in segment three, as promised, I'm going to um, basically share with you what are some other cars that existed in the in the 1880s in this time period and towards the end of this segment we're going to be discussing some world events that were going on in the 1880s just to give you a, a time period or to give you a perspective on how long ago this time period actually was um so what other cars existed in the 1880s you may ask well one thing that we tend to forget when we're discussing vehicles is that there were steam vehicles. Um, granted, these steam vehicles had been around for quite some time. I mean, the first steam vehicle was the Fardier de Cugnot, which was, um, I believe invented in 1763. Granted, these are not considered cars because they don't they don't have internal combustion engines. Um, it's not it's not the same sort of thing. And even then, they're not even considered steam cars. These are more the Faudier de Cugno was like a steam tractor. And then the other cars or quote unquote cars I should say were more considered road trains than anything they were more like road going locomotives because um, let me take an example for you the French inventor Amédée Boulay um, had been making steam cars since the 1870s the first one he, um, he called the L'Obéissante in 1873 um, it had a cruising speed of 19 miles per hour and a top speed of 25 miles per hour and it was driven by two uh, by two uh, steam engines one for each rear wheel so it was rear wheel driving everything but here's the thing it needed two people to operate it because one needed coal and water reserves, and the other one needed to operate things like the brakes, the steering, the everything like that. It wasn't until probably the 1780s or the 1790s that he had developed a model that could be driven by one person. So this wasn't, it wasn't viable as far as being an automobile that could be driven by one person that can be used for personal use, that can be put to several uses. So even though it technically was something that moved under its own power, it did not do that automatically. Some, you know, some person had to be, you know, feeding the engine coal and water in order for it to keep on going, thus disqualifying it from being considered a automobile. It is a locomotive. It, 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 it moved it moved under its own power, but they did not do it automatically, which is the difference between a locomotive and an automobile. So there you have it. It was these are these were technically 
cars, I guess you can say. They were vehicles that existed at the time. Um, the first electric car, however, saw its debut in 1888, just two years after Benz. So, a lot of people these days, and of course, you all would have heard this on my electric cars podcast that I did a few months ago. Um, a lot of people these days tend to think that the electric car is some sort of new invention. The electric car is not new at all. If cars have been around since 1886, let's see, 1886 was 135 years ago. Electric cars have been around since 1888, so they've been around since 133 years ago. I mean, they've only been around two, you know, electric cars have are only two years younger than internal combustion engine cars, for that matter. It's just one has to keep in mind, in those days, battery technology was not nearly what it was today. So batteries, whereas... You know, today you can get three, four hundred miles out of range on your electric car under full charge. Whew, pardon me. But in those days, I mean, you could probably get 30, 40 miles if you were lucky. I mean, they were not viable as everyday cars. I mean, you could use them as commuter cars, but you couldn't use them to go on a road trip because you have to keep on stopping to be charging and other sorts of foolishness at that. And of course, there were no charging stations. So however the heck you were supposed to charge these things, I have no earthly clue. So uh, electric cars, electric cars, they were probably the most reliable. They were probably you know, the most comfortable, the most quiet, probably the most luxurious, frankly, as far as overall driving experience. They just weren't, they weren't very, they weren't very viable. They weren't very usable, um, is the thing. I've seen them. I've sat in electric cars from this era. I mean, they're absolutely gorgeous. They're very quiet and everything, but they're just not very practical. I mean, who wants a car that you can only drive 30 miles on on a full charge? I mean, it just, it just doesn't. It just doesn't cut it, y'all. It just doesn't cut it. So that car was the Flocken Electrowagon, or as you would say in English, Flocken Electrowagon, which basically means electric car in German, um, because, you know, for them, I guess the suffix wagon means car, like Volkswagen means people's car, the Volkswagen, um, the, the, the patent motor wagon, motor car, um, uh, electro wagon, um, electro, electric car. So, wagon means car in German. Um, even though if you were to say, um, das Auto, das Auto means it's a car. So, auto is like the word auto means car, but wagon, like the, uh, the, uh, suffix means car too. So, that's a little German for you. But anyway, let's move on. So, World events that were going on in the 1880s. Now, the 1880s, this is this is still the Victorian era. Uh, Queen Victoria was still on the throne. Queen Victoria had about 11 more years to go. No, wait. This is the 1880s. She had about 21 more years to go because she had reigned for, oh, I believe 63 years, something as a, of that sort. And she died in 1901. Thus, her reign ended in 1901. So by the time 1880 rolled around, I mean, she still had a good 20, 21 years left to, ro uh, to, the, to reign on the throne. Um... But other than that sort, uh, of course, I had to sneak in the little British royal family in there because I'm, I'm absolutely obsessed with the British royal family. I'm obsessed with them and cars. So, uh, yeah, eclectic person over here. But anyway, uh, there were frequent lynchings, unfortunately, of blacks in the American South during the 1880s. This is the time of Reconstruction, or at least the time shortly after Reconstruction. Um, Reconstruction lasted up until the early to mid 1770s. So by this time, um, or not 1770s, 1870s. So by this time, Reconstruction is over. Um, it's about 
five, ten years in the past, and Andrew Johnson has just made a mess of the South. I mean, he ended Reconstruction early. The blacks who had begun to get rights, you know, you had black people that had begun to get into Congress, black people that had become just, he just, he just disenfranchised them. So that was, that was what was going on in the American South during the 1880s. A lot of sharecropping going on, and sharecropping, I mean, is one step above slavery. I mean, it's not, it's not too much different, because sharecroppers didn't really get paid so much. Sharecroppers worked on the land and harvested the crops, and for to stay on the land. So for a share of the crops that they harvested, that would be, you know, their sort of payment for them to continue to live on the land. They did the most of the heavy duty work. And then as your payment, that would allow you to continue living on the land. They give you a share of the crops, just share cropping. But anyway, um, yes, the Berlin Conference of 1884 to 1885, when the Western powers divided Africa, just a bit of history for you all. Um, Africa, uh, Africa's really been hacked up by European colonialism. I mean, if you know anybody who's from Africa, they can tell you that. Either whether they be white or native African, as in like black folks. I mean, you know, they've really been hacked up by the Europeans because Africa. Uh, the entire continent has thousands of ethnic groups and tribes. So if you were to divide Africa along ethnic group boundaries, where one ethnic group lives and the other one begins, and what language these people speak, there would also be thousands of different countries in Africa. The Europeans came through and just drew straight lines in the sand or in the in the dirt and were like, okay, this half belongs to this country, that half belongs to that country. Well, what happens when that straight line goes through, you know, tribal territory? Tribal territory, for example, if you're a Hutu and, you know, the Hutus live in one place and then half of the Hutus end up living there, and then the other half end up living in a completely different country. Now, let's say one of these countries speaks French. The other one speaks English. I mean, you're, you're diverging. You're diverging. You're having people who are related, people who are not wealthy enough to leave just like everybody else left. You have those people who are now suffering as a result because they're coming in. And there's, there's not only a brain drain in the country, but their own tribe has been divided and therefore weakened by, you know, colonialism. They come through, they don't realize the structures of society that are already in place because, you know, for the European man, the African African man was a savage. I mean, he knew nothing, and which is absolutely incorrect. I mean, these people had civilizations. They had a way of living. They had a way of doing everything. And then we come through and we swoop in and be like, ah, yes, do this, America better. So therefore, be like America. And then you know we, we go through and you know chop it up. And if not America in this case, Europe in general. I mean, it's just it's one of those things. It's one of those things, y'all. Um, and then, of course, there were five presidents um, in the U.S. during this decade, which had been the most since the 1840s. So in this decade, you had Rutherford B. Hayes, James A. Garfield, Chester A. Arthur, Grover Cleveland, um, and Benjamin Harrison. So, yeah, that's that's about it as far as the uh, oh, history and other cars that existed during this time. Of course, I know it's not strictly a car podcast, or it, it is strictly a car podcast. It's not strictly car related if I talk about these other things. But I feel like it's important for you to realize what was going on in the world during this time period, for you to really you know, appreciate um, the car technology that was also being developed. I mean, there were wars, there was famine, there was this, there was that. I mean, there's always all of that foolishness. But like, you know, the fact that cars were able to thrive through all of that is an amazing feat in itself. But anyway, um, please stay tuned for the next segment. I'm going to discuss my thoughts with you on the 1880s and the Benz Patent motor wagon in general. So uh, please stay tuned. 
Do you work in the world of marketing and advertising? Are you a media buyer or the owner of an agency? Have you been looking for a podcast to help stay on top of all the goings on of those worlds? The GSMC Marketing News Podcast is dedicated to keeping you up to date on all things concerning marketing and advertising. Get the latest marketing news from what major businesses have planned for the coming year to the newest trends in advertising from podcasts, digital and streaming to the old standbys of radio, television and billboards. The GSMC Marketing News Podcast has you covered whether you're a marketing agent or a business trying to expand your brand. Alrighty, folks, welcome back. So in the in the last segment, we discussed um, basically other cars that existed at the time period and some historical events that were going on in that time period as well, just so you to get a good perspective on what was going on in the world during, you know, this car's influential uh, decade, if you will. Um... And then now we're going to be discussing my own thoughts. As you all know, I like, you know, to give you all my thoughts towards the end of a podcast for me to, you know, really be genuine with you. I don't want me to seem like some podcast host that's behind the switchboard or whatever this thing is called. I forgot what it's called. Um, you know, which is just sitting here recording a podcast and then uploading it for me to not, you know, give you my genuine thoughts as well. I though I've been pretty good about inserting my opinion on there, but like not every single, uh, you know, segment is my opinion piece. Sometimes I have to get actual practical information out there. So, ooh. Oh, pardon me, goodness. I mean, yikes, yikes. I do not like yawning on recording, but anyway, um, nature calls. But anyway, so my thoughts. Okay, I'm going to be talking about the invention of the car in general. I mean, wow. I'm just thinking, if the modern automobile did not exist, I would not be the person I am today. I have grown up playing with toy cars. I have grown up, you know, being fascinated with car video games, actual cars, toy cars, you know, paintings of cars. I can remember, you know, going to the, the, the book fair in elementary school and spending money that my parents gave me on books to get car posters to put on my walls. I mean, you know, this is, this was essential to my childhood, my love of cars. And if automobiles had not existed, that's one thing I would not have had. So like, you know, I feel like it's just so amazing that the invention of the car took over the world with a relative storm just within a few years after it had been produced and then a few decades before it became available to the common man so within 30 years the car was ah yeah the car was commonplace i mean yeah yeah that's a car if you remember what i said earlier in the podcast it's as if though you know technology had advanced so quickly up until that point that you know if you had been in ancient egypt 30 years ago from the time whatever year would have been in ancient Egypt would have felt like yesterday because technology just didn't move that quickly. People didn't move that quickly. You know, empires didn't fall that quickly. Invasions didn't happen. I mean, it took hundreds of years for things to get weakened and for them to finally, you know, crumble at, you know, whatever provocation. I mean, it's not the same way when you're discussing the car world. The discuss discussing the car world, here we are in 2021. 30 years ago was 1991. Sweet Jesus, oh my land. But anyway, 30 years ago was 1991. You could conceivably drive a 1991 car on the road today this is true but my goodness is the technology way behind 
The technology is so far behind, and that's because within 30 years, I mean, every single year, new advancements in technology are being made. New advancements, new advancements, new advancements. From the time that in 91, cars didn't even need to come with airbags. They didn't need to. That was no longer, that was not, you know, a federal mandate yet at that point. So you take a 1991 Cadillac Brome, no airbags. They had seatbelts with no airbags. That's crazy. I mean, then you get into, you know, the, the mid-90s and other things of that. So, of course, we'll discuss this when we actually get to that decade. But it's just it's just amazing, the advancement of technology and how that was able to change the world as people knew it. Um, Carl Benz's legacy lives on in a grandiose fashion. I mean, look at Mercedes-Benz. Still, as much as I don't like them, as much as I think they're not reliable, as much as they think, as much as I think that they've taken the German engineering to a stupid new level, but they are still the most successful luxury brand on earth. I can plot myself anywhere that's populated and then, you know, show a Mercedes Benz logo to someone and they'll be able to tell you what that is. Globalization, the car market, the 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 international appeal that Mercedes Benz holds. I mean, that's what's causing that's what's causing, you know, Carl Benz's legacy to continue to live on. Notice how the company, however, is called Mercedes Benz, not just Benz. Well, mind you, Mercedes, on the other hand, was um, a separate car company, a separate car company that had existed up until around the 1920s. And Mercedes and Benz had decided to merge in like 1926. So up until from 1883 to 1920-something, I mean, that was a time where you know, they were, there were cars that were advancing and everything. I mean, you know, 1883 to, um, um, uh, oh goodness gracious, 1883 to around 1926, um, those two car companies were, were advancing in their own rights, but they were different car companies. There was Mercedes with cars of, cars of the like, like the Mercedes Simplex. And then there were, um, there was Benz like the Benz Patton Motor Wagon and the Benz Velo, which, you know, surpassed, which succeeded, I should say, the uh, Benz Patton Motor Wagon. It was its, its successor. That's the word I should have used. So, yeah, there were there were different car companies at the time, but 1920s, they merged for forever to be known as Mercedes-Benz. So we still have the car company that invented the car that is still rolling around on people's, you know, roads today. I mean, we've got two outside, my dad's S-Class and my dad's E-Class that sit outside in the driveway that he drives on occasion. I mean, it's just, it's crazy to think about that these cars have a direct lineage from the very first car ever made. Like, in this case, today we may complain about German engineering, how hard it is to fix parts on a German car, how it is to do this, how it is to do that, the ridiculousness of this, the ridiculousness of that. But goodness gracious, are we ever more thankful for German engineering than we are now knowing that they invented the car? And the first car didn't blow up in Carl Benz's face when he started it and tried driving it. It certainly didn't blow up in Bertha Benz's face when she took it on a 132-mile round trip. I mean, this is this is a pretty big deal, a pretty big deal. I mean, this is this is really something. Um, this is this car, the Benz Patton Motor Wagon, would eventually um, go down in history books, and it would be largely forgotten by the new car enthusiast because that's not something you see under there. Um, you don't see, you know, but anyway. Um, so, this car would definitely affect the next decade simply by being the first car ever made. There were technological advances 
that were introduced in this vehicle that one could only hope and dream of having at the time. But nonetheless, they made it into this vehicle, and then they became standard equipment not only in this car, but in several other cars. And of course, it takes a few years for these things to catch on. So by the 1890s, however, the technological advances that the 1883 Benz Patent Motor, or 1886 Benz Patent Motor Wagon um, had developed had all been there. They had all been there, and they were competing against the latest, greatest, and newest cars. And this is the 1890s we're talking about. So, yeah, that's that's basically how it's affected the next decade. And the thing is, the Benz Patton motor wagon is such an important thing. I mean, heck, you know, you, you know pop culture even abra- embraces this car. You can play it... You know, you can play this car in the video game Gran Turismo 4 on the PlayStation um, um, 3, I believe. I mean, that's just how much it's been embraced by people who know you know that this is the very first car ever made. I mean, today, this is nothing more than a glorified golf cart with three wheels. But my land, for me to, to, to sit across, you know, a specimen of this vehicle. Uh, is so important, so just mind-boggling, mind-boggling that this thing, this humble, horseless carriage, essentially, started it all. That's not something I'll ever be able to wrap my head around because, you know, Carl Benz, before doing this, he still had to introduce, he still had to, you know, make up... um he still had to uh, create the internal combustion engine, and so things things were not that easy um, at all for him. But anyway, so in the next uh, podcast, I should probably tease the next podcast, but in the next podcast, we're going to be discussing the most influential car of the 1890s. And like I said, I'm going to take these last couple of minutes for me to, you know, put a question out there to the community just to test these waters a, a little bit concerning the uh, the Instagram account. Um, what is your favorite car from the 1890s? I know that's not a car that you, that's not an answer that you get all the time, but I want to know what's your favorite car from the 1890s or heck, your favorite car from the 1880s. We haven't gotten to the 1890s yet. And then if you answer in the next podcast, I'm going to give you a shout out. So please answer, please like, please subscribe, um, and please Please follow us on Instagram, especially follow us on Twitter. We don't tweet nearly as often as we post on Instagram, but we're working on everything concerning the social media. This is new waters for us. So please stay tuned. And I hope you enjoyed, you know, the GSMC podcast. This has been the GSMC car podcast by your host, David Lucy Mabel. Uh, Please look at our social media, follow us. Um, Yeah. So thank you and have a good night. You've been listening to the GSMC Car Podcast, part of the GSMC Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type GSMC into your favorite podcast app to find all of the shows from the GSMC Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, from business news to weird news. Please subscribe to the podcast and follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you've enjoyed today's episode.